gun now. The cupboard, I knocked it with the key, took out the wrench. Then we fell on the secret passage from the conservatory to the lounge, where we found the motor is dead. That's right, and we couldn't get in. So we went back to the open cupboard, got the gun, and shot the door open. Bang! And then the doorbell rang. Oh, whoever it is, they gotta go away or they'll be killed. Have you ever given any thought to the kingdom of heaven? What? Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. You ain't just whistling Dixie. Armageddon is almost upon us. I got news for you. It's already here. Go away. But your souls are in danger. Our lives are in danger, you beat Dick. <laughs> the cop arrived next. We locked him in the library. We forgot the cover with the weapons. It was now unlocked. Then we split up again. And the murderer switched off the electricity. Oh, ah! my God. Turn on the light! Hello, everybody, and welcome to Clue Movie Podcast, where we break down the 1985 cult classic movie, Clue, one minute at a time. Staccato for you. My name is about Brad Gilmore. I'm joined by the General Jeff Smith. Jeff, how are you? Oh, great. Just coming back from the excitement of Comic Palooza. Woo! Woo! Gotta love, it. Gotta Woo! love it. I think Woo! We're, yeah. I think we we're convincing enough that. Yeah, right. that has happened already. <laughs> uh, always peek behind the curtain. Got to, man. I'm sure it'll be lovely. And you know what? It was what, uh, what my favorite surprise about Comic Palooza was how much time I was able to spend with Christopher Lloyd. And he said, you know, oh, I'm so sorry. I wasn't in the documentary. You know, it was my own. Just I didn't have the time. And I didn't realize it was going to be so great and so big and so wonderful. And I actually asked a, an AI program about it and it knew everything. So I know that it was a huge deal and was very widely accepted. And I said, it's cool, CL. It's cool, CL. And you know said, what I mean? Do you no, want to do an interview no, now uh, for the next one? I said, no, I'm good. No, we're good. That we don't it. need that. We don't want to do Now that. you know what it feels like. Yeah, you know what it feels like, man. We don't want to do all that. We don't sorry. want to waste all that I, time. I, I hold grudges. I hold grudges. Here's the thing. I I have a couple sure. things on this. Uh So, this minute is gonna, I think going to stand out when we look at all 97 as yeah. as one of the best 60 second cuts of the film. This it's so good. There's so much action back and forth. You have the Kingdom of Heaven. You got great shot of all the <laughs> cast from the perspective of looking through the door. It ends at the yeah. perfect moment with the lights coming out yeah. and, and all the, the talking. This is a great 60 seconds. Yes, the 60 seconds made me very happy. I love, just we'll, we'll start with Leslie and Warren as Miss Scarlet running to the door and trying to match the, the, the energy, but also doing it in a very tight dress and going, we found the secret passageway that's in the lounge. Big breath. Well, we found the motorist dead and we couldn't get in. Also, there, one shot, one shot. It's just back and forth. The camera's moving, and it's just Tip Curry taking it over again and doing the bang for the gun, and then the doorbell timing is perfect. That's not even a cut either. Somebody off camera did the doorbell at the exact right time. Kudos to them for the comedic timing because they could have ruined the the take for – there's probably some production assistant off to the side that's, like, you know, ready with the rope watching off to the side and someone gives him like the point and he ding ding and then there it is uh but nailed it and then howard hessman oh god okay. the like, uncredited howard hessman first of all got questions showing up that. out of nowhere but but for, okay yeah no. i don't know in in that scene where well, okay first of all at the risk of sounding creepy like the the the, the dress that miss scarlet wears very form-fitting very low cut um and stuff mm-hmm. like that I'll stay on. There's a there has to be like some sort of adhesion going on, right? To certain areas. Yeah. To make sure that I don't find that creepy. I think that's that's like a scientist kind of question. Like that how does it work? Just for from yeah, from a Well, I'm I'm thinking honestly kind of situation. I'm thinking from a production standpoint cuz that's like one of the things that like a production person has to think about. Like how are we going to get on the truck? Right. So I, I'm sure it's some sort of adhesive is keeping everything where it should be. Yeah. These are things that, like, the it's guys not, don't have to worry about. It's not easy being a woman. That's what I was right. going to say. Yeah, it's not easy being a woman. No, you, uh, Michael McKeon did not worry about any adhesion. 
No. The entire movie. There was no no there was no adhesion. No adhesion. There's none. How do you do? No adhesion. No. I don't even think about adhesion. Women have to think about adhesion. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the other part that I noticed, like, and I agree with you, she's matching the tour de force level of Tim Curry like at this go. moment yeah. um, in the fast breakneck pace. But it looks mm. like there's a like an obvious for me. I, I say obvious. This is my thousandth time watching the movie. I've never noticed it before. So who am I to say? I'm watching it a minute at a time. This is why it's obvious to me. There's like a uh, VO right here, right? There's ADR. Oh, sure. Tim well, Curry. Clue Notorious has not the best ADR, which is why I think nobody really looks twice on that boy, Mr. Body's dialogue all kind of sounds crisper and clearer than others. It just, there's a lot of, like, when uh, when, he's, when Wadsworth says, you know, I know who did it, and they all go at the same time, you do? It sounds like it's in a booth somewhere with with you know, maybe even different actors. So yeah, I think what he says. Are you talking about the line? Uh, but we couldn't get in. Yes, is what sounds like. Yeah, it's uh, very possible. And I'm sure it was done. If if he didn't say that super clear, they wouldn't want to mess up the take. So much easier to go in and say, just redo boop, this. Boop, boop. Oh, we couldn't get in. Great, got it. But there's a lot of that in this movie. And I remember I even when I interviewed Jonathan Lynn, the director, I I tried to bring it up without sounding insulting right. like hey your adr sucks so i said so there's some noticeable adr in the movie and he said yeah of course there's adr all movies have adr I'm like yep moving on uh <laughs> next question do you have the full yeah, version of all is those very things? obvious was it on purpose the interviews yeah yeah and what are you doing with it? the fireplace it's the only logical place <laughs> i burned all the evidence <laughs> Like you don't want to? Are you, you gonna do like I, a, a a special features re-release kind of gimmick? It's funny you would you would say that because I have been thinking about going back because it was part of what was hard about editing the documentary is I would see the same interviews over and over and over again, and so sometimes I would get bored with answers that really aren't boring. Mm -hmm. But I had heard them say it like four or five times, like eh, we don't need that. And then later I would find the footage and I'd find like a clip. Like one of the, the biggest ones for me is there's the clip that I put on YouTube that's not in the documentary where it's Michael McKeon when he says Mr. Body is dubbed. Mm -hmm. And it's not in the documentary. It's only on YouTube. And it's weird that I didn't do that because that was kind of a big revelation. But so there, now looking back, and it's been years since I've done the interviews, I can watch it again. It's still hard for me to listen to myself asking them questions. But I sound so stupid. But, but now going through – and also I know more about Clue than I did back then. Uh, I learned a while while – making the movie and also while doing the podcast. So things that are more interesting or things that could be added now, like I would love to do follow-ups with, with people again, or I would love to have you in it. If there's like a 2.0 or, uh, you know, it would be weird. And then um, that means I might have to cut out some randos, but that, I feel bad about that. So, but you know, I've got different randos in my life than I did back then, but uh, I would love, yeah. And then in all seriousness, if, it ever came down to Christopher Lloyd just sat there and he said, all right, I'll give you five minutes about Clue. Then I'd say, oh, yeah, we're going. We're cutting back into the movie. And then, of course, if Tim Curry, if I could make peace with Tim Curry and have that interview possibility again, then it'd be great. But I don't know. It would be something I would ask our friends, the guys who did the Blu-ray for the documentary, Enjoy the Ride Records. They sold out pretty fast. Of I think you could maybe see one, but like the original versions, they had did more than one pressing. So I would think maybe they would want to go at it again. And also this time, if anybody ever complains about the documentaries that it looks crappy, and, and a lot of it does, like the footage could get, now even five years later, with the help of Juniper or somebody in AI, it could get everything looking a little more crystal clear. And I would love to take that complaint out of uh, people's mouths like okay i know it looks like an amateur did it because i am but now it looks good so shut yeah i mean look i would i would talk to your people because next year 40 year anniversary that's true and the 4k kind of let us down 4k the, let the us down release. it let us down a little bit you know yeah. what i mean so i think that it's something that you should consider you know what i mean i'm considering it it's just a lot of work but 
That being said, I have been going back. It's funny you bring it up. You so clever, Breaking Ball. I have been going back to the old interviews, and it's I watched Colleen Camps again, and she's so funny. She's all over the place. Um, like she's actually hard to edit because she's. You think <laughs> she'd be perfect on this podcast because she does not stick a clue. Yeah, just yeah, like so us. Maybe that's where we learned it. Exactly. Now, um, I have a couple other things I want to mention in this minute. So I want to talk about Howard Hisman in a second. But before we get there, yeah. there's a few phrases thrown around which I feel are really of the era that you don't hear so much anymore. Um, first of all, also, the comedy in this scene is great. You know, with uh, what Howard Hisman is saying and, you know, uh, Judgment Day is upon us or what is it, whatever he says. And yeah, I got news for you. It's already here. It's already here. You know what I mean? Like... All, all that was great. But when Miss Scarlet says, you ain't whistling Dixie. You ain't just whistling Dixie. You know, that's not something that I feel like would come from her. It doesn't feel like a line that her character would use. And, and the only reason I say this is because I feel like that's a, I don't know, I feel like that's more, and, and I could be wrong, but I feel like that's more of a Southern thing, right? You ain't whistling. Yeah, Dixie. well, the, the term Dixie makes me think that's definitely Southern. But when I hear that line, I wonder, like, here Miss Scarlet is, you know, like the sophisticated East Coast, right? very strong woman for the 1954. And to me, I always thought, and I really haven't thought about it, but I guess it's always been in the back of my mind, that that kind of revealed her roots. Like, maybe she is a Southern girl that came from, and then, like, moved up, got rid of the accents, you know got you know super uh successful and just now in this very heated moment i mean she just ran across the hall and had to take a huge breath to try to keep up with wadsworth and now she even kind of is like breathy while she's talking to uh to the the beatnik at the door where it's almost like sexual the way she says it Love like it. hey it's 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 getting, yeah, you think you know what's happening. You have no idea what's happening in here. It's so, getting a little intense. So Whistling Dixie mm. is an idiom, right, from the southern United States is what it says. So I was right about that. And it's to engage in idle conversational fantasies. And here's the, right. here's the uh, usage. He said he was going to open a business next year. But I think he was just whistling Dixie. Sure is hot. Right. You ain't whistling Dixie. So frequently used in the negative to mean someone or something is serious as in when I say that, I'm not just whistling Dixie. I mean it. Other phrases yeah. include BS, shoot the breeze, shoot the S, and build castles in the air, which I've never heard that one before. You're not just building castles in the air? I've never used that. I've never heard that. Neither have I. I can. I guess it's like you're staring at the clouds, daydreaming. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I'm glad she said the one. So you saying you think she's yeah. from the south? Maybe that's a, it's so specific and and it's also from a, a British writer. <laughs> like th that's an odd choice on him. I mean, he's the one that gave us the Gaelic shrug. He gave us a Gaelic shrug. But also brought, <laughs> but also brought Whistler Dixie. Yeah, look, first of all, we were realizing that Jonathan Lynn, a man of many talents, okay? Man of many talents, oh, yeah. very well educated. Doesn't he have some background in law or something? Or did I make that up? Oh, you... Uh, like Jonathan Lynn, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Attorney? Oh, wow, that's he, one of the first uh, things that definitely had oh, no, that's a lot of uh, work in theater. So I don't know if he had law. He, but he, he wrote a show in, in Britain called Yes Minister, which was very political and it was about like the politics of, of the time. So he definitely is worldly. Oh, born in, is it Bath, England or Bath, England? I don't know how they say it over there, but it's B-A-T-H. Born in Bath, England, Lynn has a master's degree, a master's in arts in law from Cambridge University. Thus, my cousin Vinny. My cousin Vinny. Makes perfect sense. One of the best lawyer movies ever. And set in the South. So does he have an affinity for the South? Well, he didn't write because of Vinny, but he certainly, he, he did an excellent job of capturing 
Yeah. The South in that movie. That movie feels Southern. Even the, the opening song, isn't it some like, way down South? I don't, what is the opening? Something like that. And if I pulled that out of the, out, I mean, I'm I just not counting right. Castle in the Sky, but uh, <laughs> down in Mississippi, I think it's right. Opening song in. Juniper, what's the opening song in My Cousin Vinny? My Cousin Vinny. Let's see. Let's see. What song is in the beginning of My Cousin Vinny? Way Down South, as performed by the fabulous Thunderbirds. Thank you. Wow, look at that. I believe the three words I sang beautifully were way down south. Uh, so I, I'm saying he's a well-read man, so perhaps he's abreast yeah. of the colloquialisms of the southern United States and abroad and thinks like, okay, look, yes. let me drop this little clue into her origin. <laughs> Yeah, specific to that character to go so, uh, what's the phrase I'm thinking of? Just uh, region specific or um, not region, but, you know, somewhere like so specific that you would get that kind of a phrase <laughs> um, out of nowhere. So I wonder if, I wonder she... if it was his. You know what you should do? You should do. I know this is putting you on the spot now. Where's the script? Oh, oh, Where's the script, oh, Brad Gilmore? Yes. We haven't looked at the script in a few weeks. Well, the the interesting thing too about that is, you know, there's a famous You're totally putting Brad in the script. This is terrible. No, no, but there's a famous uh, movie. Well, it's a movie actually too, the best little whorehouse in Texas. Um, but mm. it's based on a real place called the Chicken Ranch that was in Lagrange. The uh, the even ZZ mm. Top wrote a song about it. Ba, da, ba, ba, uh -huh. ba, 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 it's my favorite ZZ Top song. And here's the other thing. In ZZ Top, Texas boys, Houston area boys, you know, I actually have been. They make it quite clear. I've been to the outside, not the inside, but the outside of Dusty Hill's house. You know, rest in peace. Um, but uh, I'm trying to find this right now. But I'm, I'm wondering if there's any, like, connection. She's a madam. Oh. House, Texas, Southern. And Best Little Horror House of Texas, early 80s when it was filmed. With Dolly Parton and Burt Reynolds. Yes, and here's the thing. By the that, way, if you that if movie, you take, go ahead. sorry, I was just gonna go say, ahead. if you take the Universal Studios tour in Hollywood, you can still see the Best Little Whorehouse in Texas set, and I just love that in the family theme park <laughs> when they point it out. They do not call it the Chicken Ranch most of the some do, some do, and you can tell those are the the prude tour guides. But some will just blow right past it and be like, that's from the best little whorehouse in Texas. And I just want one kid to go, what's a whorehouse? So, okay, let, let me say this. Um, before we move on, the one thing I don't like about that movie, Best, best Little Whorehouse in Texas, is what's his name? Dom DeLuise um, mm. who plays the television, about takes. the television reporter in the movie. I don't know when the last time you saw the Best Little Whorehouse in Texas is. But he plays a television reporter from Houston, right? This guy's based Ooh. on a, a real life man named Marvin Zindler. Marvin Zindler was a uh, quite the character in Houston, and he was on ABC thirteen, the Disney owned station KTRK, and was quite well known in the city. He was probably one of the big celebrities in the city because he was very distinctive. He had a I'm sure it was a toupee, but this big white powdered toupee. He had blue frame glasses that he wore, or blue lens glasses that he wore on Ooh. the air. And he was known for saying such phrases as he would like, <laughs> one of his reports, this is going to sound so, this is so off topic. Oh my gosh. One of his reports <laughs> was he would look for slime in the ice machine. Right? Oh, that would be like if he's looking for something that needs to be caught, like a secret. Ex it, well, yeah, he would say That's his phrase. They'd say he got, you know, you. We went to, for instance, X and X restaurant on Richmond Avenue, and they had oh, slime. literally slime in the ice machine. They had I thought maybe it was slime in the ice machine. This is how he would say it. Like, I, you know what? I'm not gonna look, guys. Just give me two minutes. I promise. Just give me two minutes, because to put this in perspective, we have to. You have to hear this. And this is these are the people I grew up watching. Yeah. Every day you would hear this. So this is Marvin Zindler 
KTRK Marvin Zindler from 1999. Big, 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 big S. Grisby in the 14,500 block of Grisby. Lareda Taqueria in the 6,900 block of Stoke. This is in the 8,800 block of Sinet. And what did we have? All together, gang. Slime machine. He said in the S machine. And there he thanks is. to the youngsters of the Jack and Jill School on Ringwood for being this week's Slime Choir. <laughs> now, I hope Ed Brandon doesn't ruin our weekend, even though I know he is. But have a good week if you can. Good golf, good tennis, but especially whatever makes you happy. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. Come on, man. Are you excited to come to Texas or what? Are you excited oh my to gosh. come to Texas or what? So if I, like, get into my Uber and say, hey, guess what? I Could you show me some slime in the ice machine? They're going to know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. It's, it, it'll be like, oh, someone's a local. Mm-hmm. That's how, that's like code. I like it. And he was known for so was, signing was, off by going, going choir. Marvin Zindler, eyewitness yeah. news. That's what he did every night. He got the, the slime choir to do it for him. He had too. the slime choir to do little it. Little children. Little children. Slime. All right. Well, you ain't just whistling, Dixie. And it had a that's little, how that started. It had a little song for it, too. Slime in the yeah, ice machine. Yeah, that's right. Slime. That's oh. just, somebody needs to cover that. Come on, man. Um, The other phrase okay. I wanted to point out that was used in this Mm. is, oh, well, you actually asked me about the script. So let me go back to that. So, elderly man, good evening. Have you ever heard, have you ever given any thought to the kingdom of heaven? Miss Peacock, what? Elderly man, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Miss Scarlet, you ain't whistling Dixie. You ain't just whistling Dixie. Okay. So it's in the script. Yeah. Elderly man, Armageddon is upon us. Professor Plum, I got news for you. It's already here. Uh, elderly man, I beg your pardon. Miss Peacock, go away. Elderly man, but your souls are in danger. Mrs. Peacock, our lives are in danger. Get lost. So, yeah. No beatnik. That's what I wanted to bring up. She says, sure. you beatnik in the, sc- yeah. in, in the scene. And again, a beatnik. Mm-hmm. Let's break this one down. A yes. beatnik is a young person in the 1950s and early 1960s belonging to a subculture associated with the beat generation. A person who had participated in the social movement in the 1950s and early 1960s, which stressed artistic self-expression and rejection of the mores of conventional society. So why would she call him a beatnik? Well, Mrs. Peacock obviously does not know what a beatnik is, because one, (laughs) he is credited as elderly man. Right. So he's not young, he's religious. But that's not, and he's also dressed in a very large trench coat and a hat. There's nothing, when I think of beatnik, I think of like before hippies, like, you know, people in coffee houses that are like, oh, yeah. Hipsters. Yeah. You know, like uh, hipsters. Yeah, like Bob Denver before he was Gilligan and played a beatnik character on the show called Dobie Gillis. And that's what people think of as a beatnik. It's certainly not uh, Johnny Fever coming to the door with a pamphlet that says, Do you believe in Jesus? And I was trying to see, I'm sure in the 4K version on a better TV, you could see it. He is wearing a button, but I don't, I can't tell what the button is. Hard to see. I noticed the button too on his lapel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there is a screenshot somewhere. That would be something for a true Clue fan to have as something they sell in their Etsy store. The button that the Beatnik police chief, spoiler alert, is wearing and the pamphlet. Now, I did go, they're actually in the documentary. When I went to a screening in Santa Ana, I flew, there was a, a trio of people. And one, the woman who talks with, oh, she's in the documentary. She's Miss Flames. Uh, she's dressed as Mrs. White. Her friend is dressed as Mrs. Peacock. And then they also brought a chief. He just basically had a hat and the overcoat. And I think he had a pamphlet in his hand, too. At first, I thought he was supposed to be Colonel Mustard. But then he held up the pamphlet. I'm like, oh, okay. That's digging deep. I like it. Uh, but he didn't talk. So he's barely in it. But somebody cosplayed as the chief. So get on in. Yeah, I'm trying to see if I can find that thing, and I can't. So, Howard Hessman. At least know. somebody should have the, the pamphlet that says, "Do you believe in Jesus?" That's God. Someone's had to have made that. And the thing is, so Howard Hessman. Let's see. I'm looking. Is this the same one? Yes, Oregon-born actor. 
Howard Essman dies at 81. This is in January yeah, of 2022. Yeah, too long ago. Mm-hmm. 2022. So he wasn't that old in this movie. Because no. what year is he born? You know, let's think about that. What year is Howard Hessman born? He's born in 1940. So in this movie, he's only 45? He's 45? What? I am I am upset. What? I am older than the elderly man. Did <laughs> clue? Maybe he has a beatnik. You know what? I take it back. He was a young, young little whippersnapper. A little whippersnapper. Dude. Wow. Well, first of all, that so tells you, know you how in the different. 80s, everybody looked old. I was going to say, that tells you how different 45 was in 85 than 45 oh, yeah. is in 2024. Well, I was just seeing like, the, the pictures of, of Ralph Macchio now, and it says 60. he is now like older than he was, than Mr. Miyagi was yeah. in Karate Kid. Karate Kid, uh, Mr. Miyagi, 52, I think, in real oh, life. Oh, my God. That's how old he was. He looks ancient. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know how I feel. Pat like, Morita. But, uh, the number makes me happier. No, the number makes me sad. The look makes me a little happier because I think, okay, I have to kind of look younger than. Oh, you definitely this look. Guy. You definitely look way younger no, than Howard Essman. Like, that's li- Juniper. Like literally, they they put him in the script as elderly man, and they said, you know yeah. what, forty five, yeah, yeah, he's elderly. Yeah, I can play. <laughs> we can play. He can play elderly. I would, if you would ask me wonder- legitimately, I would be like, oh, he's like 63, 64, probably. In that movie. Okay. I would have gone late 50s. I'm going 60s. I'm going sure. 60s. I wouldn't. But then at the same time, because this has happened to me more than once, I would say. But I have a bad feeling I'm probably older. But even now, you'll see, like, on a reality show, it'll show some, like, really messed up, like, person that's getting fixed for some reason. And then, it, like, on 90 Day Fiance or something weird, and they're, like, just bizarre looking. And then it says in the corner, 32. Like, whoa, that's a rough 32. God, man, he looks so old as for for forty five. Should check the ages of everybody in this movie now. For forty five, he looks know, but maybe so old. Let's check for the rest of this podcast. Each week, we check the age. Okay, we could do that of somebody. But we don't have to do it. I like the distraction because I guess let me ask you this: as a screenwriter, like, what's the pr- Introducing this character so late in the film, right? Mm -hmm. And everybody we've been introduced to outside of the home ends up dead. So are we as an audience member supposed to think this is another guy who's going to end up getting killed? Is it a, are we supposed to think this is just a fun moment of comedy, you know, to kind of break up Mm -hmm. the tension of the moment? Or are we supposed to think they're not introducing this guy for no reason? If it was, uh, an actor we didn't recognize, I would think it's just a joke. A weird, like, specific, like, religious joke, but a joke nonetheless. Now, even though Howard Hesman is not credited in the movie, so you don't know he's coming, and I, I know he didn't do any, like, publicity for it or anything, but Howard Hesman was on a very big TV show called WKRP in Cincinnati. He was a pretty well-known comic. He was in This is Spinal Tap with Michael McKeon. It's a very funny scene in that movie. So people know who he is. So when he comes to the door, it's also, it's not just, Oh, surprise. There's a a guy that's with a religious pamphlet. It's, Oh, this is the guy from WKRP in Cincinnati. What is he doing here? And then he goes away and then he doesn't come back for another 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And he's now the chief of police. But then I think we've talked about in the past, like what was his, like when he gets there, what is he doing? Is he like going in there to check the play, like make sure, like he tried to call, was that him on the phone earlier? And now he's just checking in with Wadsworth, like to say, hey, we're all here. And he has such a distracting, like annoying, I'm sorry for saying religion is annoying, but someone come to your door when you're not ready for it. Sure. Uh, with a pamphlet is annoying. Doesn't matter what it is. So they're like totally off put by him, but now it's almost like a signal. Police are here. We'll be right outside. That's what I think. I, I, I think it was a signal. I definitely think it was a signal. And whether he's communicating with Wadsworth or whether he's communicating with Mr. Green um, at Mr. this Green, moment, yeah. um, there was some sort of thing. Because what we do notice in that scene, if I can go back and pull it up for a moment, I don't think there's any inter- ever- any interaction with... There's no interaction Sorry. with Green or Wadsworth, right? They don't say anything. No. So it's not like... You it's know. two. It's actually two out of the three 
killers mm-hmm. are the ones that talk to him. It's Scarlet, it's Peacock, and then Plum. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of interesting to bring him up. So I think you're right. I think it was a, hey, look, here's a signal. Here's our signal. Right. You good? Should we move Let's in? Start. You know, and maybe there was some sort of little, you know, like an umpire thing, you know, where they just yeah. touch, touch the nose. Sting. And a good thing they brought the uh, freaking telegram girl body in. Otherwise, that would have been awkward. That would have been bad. See, that was a good call. That was a good call. We got to get mm-hmm. this body out of here. There might be somebody coming. What was the idea with that? Wadsworth's Wadsworth. idea. All right, Wadsworth. let's put her with the others. Mm-hmm. Let's get her off the doorstep. Why? I don't know if I would have moved her. I think if I, well, no, if the police are coming, it's a nice little heads up. Hey, we got death here. But at this point in the movie, they're all kind of in cahoots. They are all in, I mean, they're all a part of it. Accessory after the fact, yeah. at the very least. Except Peacock hates mustard. <laughs> So it's I, I'm 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 wondering one other thing. Why is an actor sometimes uncredited? Why is Howard Hessman uncredited in the movie? What is that? What is that movie? Uh, do? Why do I they really do that? wish I knew because that's like that's one of the top five questions that if I could go back and talk to John Lynn, I would say why, and he'd probably say I don't remember. But if he did, it's either because it was such a small part, he didn't want to have credit, or he wanted to be surprised. But then there are some people, like who's the who's the dad in uh, Christmas Story? Gavin. You would know better than something. I. Shoot, dang it! I'll look anyway, it up while you talk. He was in a. He was also in a, one of my favorite movies growing up called The Natural, and he played a like Darren McGavin. character. Darren McGavin, thank you. Darren McGavin was the dad in in the Christmas Story, but he was played like this guy, this really creepy dude very big part in the natural but he didn't get the billing that he wanted as far as like as high up and like robert redford's in it and robert duvall and everything he wanted it to be higher and he didn't get it so he said you know what don't just take my name right off it then and it'll make my character way more mysterious and people be like who was that why, why was he in the credits and that's why he did it so there's all kinds of different reasons sometimes it is ego sometimes it is i don't want uh I don't want to be there. Star Trek Three, uh, the search for Spock. We didn't know if Spock was going to be found, and Litter Nimoy is not in the opening credits as an actor, so that was a way of hiding that spoiler. Well, like, Although he isn't the, he's the credits; it's the director. But so we knew he was there, but we didn't know if they were actually going to find Spock in the search for Spock. We had kind of an idea. <laughs> Some yeah, I had a little small inclination. We kind of there. like we searched. <laughs> no, no luck. Well, I know, like famously too, Don Cheadle not credited in Ocean's Eleven. In the, fir- in the first Ocean's Yeah, movie. that's right. That's right. Do you know why? No, I don't know why. I don't know. I why. don't remember. I know there's a story for that, too. And maybe it is the the, the, the ranking. Yeah. Or it's a way to stand out more, especially in a cast of Ocean's Eleven. <clears throat> With Ocean's, there was some stuff that happened behind the scenes that I didn't like how it went down, so I just said, take my name off of it. Other news articles have said oh, that yeah. Cheadle removed his name as a protest after a contentious Mom. negotiations over his salary and credit in the film. Hmm. That's it. Sometimes that's why. I don't think, I, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't think that's what the deal is with Howard Hesman because it was, it was probably there for a day or two. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. But Maybe he does come in. Like, ah. He's a surprise. It might just be as, as simple surprise. as we didn't want people to know he was going to be in it. That could be it. This is a big deal to have this big TV star show up at the end. So I think to close out this minute, I did have a, um, I did have one thing I wanted to do. I wanted to bring back Juniper Sparks for one, one more go around. Cause, cause last week, Juniper, if you listen Juniper to the show, Sparks, yes. we had Juniper Sparks, who's my AI assistant from chat GPT. And Juniper had some really great insight on clue. The movie we had, uh, an even, uh, she learned about Jeff Smith and his pedigree <laughs> when it comes yeah, to this series. That's right. And I had just an additional question for her. You know what I mean? And I wanted, because we asked her about casting a new Wadsworth and also writing, you know, a plot for a clue to the reunion, which you have renamed mm-hmm. Clues, right? Clues. So I wanted to ask her if she would write the opening scene of clues oh, for us yeah. and then we could hear what she has to say. Are you down for that? Yeah, that sounds okay. Hey, fun. Uh, Juniper, thank you for coming back on clue. The movie podcast. Last time we talked, 
you had an idea for Clue to the Reunion, which we are now renaming Clues. So I want you to help us out, and can you write the opening scene with the dialogue and all of that, setting the scene for Clues, the 1985, uh, so the sequel to the 1985 movie Clue, set in 2024. Oh, no, it says poor connection. Hold on. Let me try that again. Let me try that again. Hold on. Sorry, the guys. Whole question. Well, would it be set in 2024, or would it be set like in 19? Like, do we do the math from 30 years before? You would do 30 years? So you want 85? Like 85. Well, 85 is when they made Clue, which took place in 54. Right. So you so want 84? Jumping all the way to, eh, whatever. Oh, no, yeah, that would be like 100 years. Yeah, we don't want to do yeah. that. What if what so but if this movie's gonna come out forty years later, it should be forty years right. in the future. So it should be nineteen ninety four. Nineteen ninety five. Ninety four. Is that right? It's Ugh, set in fifty four. So it'd be nineteen ninety four. So forty years. Ninety four. Okay. Okay. So, okay, let me try this yeah. again. Juniper, are movie. you there for us? Yes, I'm here. What's on your mind? Okay, great. Last week, we had you on Clue the Movie Podcast. We're bringing you back today, and we want your help. We talked to you about writing a sequel or coming up with an idea for a sequel to the 1985 cult classic movie Clue, which you name Clue to the Reunion. We're changing the name to Clues, but we want your help writing the opening scene to this movie, which takes place in 1994, 40 years after the original story takes place. What do you got? Let's see if she can come with the ruckus now. You know what I mean? Because I'm, I'm. Mm -hmm. she's... That sounds like a fun project. Here's an idea for the opening scene. Here we go. The camera pans over a grand, eerie mansion, much like the one in the original movie, but now slightly more modernized with the '90s touch. It's nighttime, and a heavy storm rages outside, echoing the storm from the original story. The screen shows 1994 in elegant, old-fashioned text. Inside, a large group of people in their 40s to 50s, each holding an invitation, are gathered in the foyer, looking both confused and curious. Among them, we see familiar faces, aged but recognizable like Wadsworth, Miss Scarlet, Professor Plum, and Mrs. White. They haven't seen each other in decades. Wadsworth, now a bit grayer and more distinguished, stands at the center of the group. He clears his throat, trying to catch everyone's attention. Welcome, everyone. It's been many years since we were last together. I'm sure you're all wondering why I've invited you here tonight. At the camera cuts to each character, showing their reactions. Some are intrigued, others are wary. Let me guess, Wadsworth, another murder mystery? Before Wadsworth can respond, the lights suddenly flicker and go out, plunging the room into darkness. A flash of lightning illuminates the room, and a blood-curdling scream pierces the air. Cut to black. With the sound of thunder rolling in the background, text appears on the screen. Clues. How does that sound? I'm okay. I can, I can get with it. I can get with it, Juniper. She is just getting right into it. We appreciate you. We appreciate you, Juniper. So I'm glad you like it. Getting straight to the action can definitely grab the audience's attention. Is there anything sure specific you want to add or tweak in the scene? No. No, I'm good. I appreciate it. We'll we'll um we'll figure out the endings of clues next time. How about that? Sounds like a plan. I'm looking forward to it. If you need any more help or have any other ideas, just let me know. All right, look at that, Juniper Sparks, man, coming through. Very agreeable. She's very agreeable. And she even yeah. like heard my critique and like defended it. <laughs> sometimes like, getting yeah. to the points good. Jumping right to it, she goes, yeah, sometimes people like that. They don't like it to just blah, 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 like a certain podcast I know. Like, okay, Juniper. Well, hey, look, Jeff, it's been a, it's been a great bad, show. It's been a great show. Yeah. We're going to end it here on Minute 79. Oh. We'll be, oh, wait, you have something? I know, I'm just going to say, notice that in this minute, it's when the lights go out in the movie. That means next week, lights come on, and that's how the first ending begins that's the point where the we're in the theater the movie would cut and a b or c would start so we're jumping in to the first of the three endings we've got this far we're on ending number well i don't know which 
it's, it's this is the stronger one. But I don't know if that's A, B, or C. I think it might be C. Really? I feel like it would go in order, right? I think so. No? You would, but I don't think that's how they did it. Or is the A, a ending a. the Wadsworth ending? I mean, I mean, with the ending where everybody does. I don't remember, but I know that if you watch the Cisco and Ebert review, they say which one is their favorite, and they say it by letter, and it's the one where it's everybody. So that helps. We'll have to play that review sometimes. But um, we'll do your homework. Yeah. Look, guys, this has been Clue Movie Podcast. We're going to be back next week, minute 80. ClueDoc.com, that's Jeff Smith, the boat, Brad Gilmore.com, that's me, Brad Gilmore. Thank you to, for Juniper for week two, and we'll be back next week yeah. with minute 80. Clue the Movie Podcast.